Hi, everyone. Yesterday's news. I have Lisa Mann of White Crone, and we are going to talk music today. How are you today? I'm doing good. I'm doing great. That's awesome. Yeah. So I hear you have a new single coming out called Stargazer. Tell me about what's going on with that and when we can expect to see that. Well, Stargazer is a, a cover of the Rainbow song Stargazer with Ronnie James Dio on the vocals. So those are some really big shoes to step into. But I love singing the song. And uh, I've uh, worked with Vinnie Apice in the past. Uh, he's done some uh recording for me for my blues project and for white crone and so i thought well who better to play the drums than than him and uh, i was looking for a guitar player to do it my friend alistair green is on guitar and uh a good friend of mine that i played in a, a hard rock metal band from high school his name's eric lawrence and he's down here in portland and uh so we remote tracked and then had it mixed and mastered at Opal Studios here in Portland, and and uh, away we go. It's going to be released July, July 9th. So next Friday. Next Friday. Looking at the calendar over here. Yeah, next That's Friday. Right. Just before Dio's birthday. I mean, did you do this as a tribute for Dio? I did. I did this in tribute to Dio and to uh, the late Jimmy Bain. Uh, they're both huge, huge influences on me. And, uh, you know, even, even my mom loved Ronnie Dio. She loved singers. My yes. mom, she loved, she loved Judy Garland and Barbara Streisand. And, uh, and so she just loved a good voice and she's passed away too. So there's just something kind of like a connection between my memories of my mom and my memories of Dio. And they both kind of occupy this, occupy the same kind of place in my heart. You know, yeah. so I really felt strongly about wanting to do a Dio song. And uh, this one just stood out to me as something I just wanted to do. I just wanted to sing it because I love it. Nice. And, you know, it's so fun because there's so many people over the years that have tried to do new, new Dio stuff that whether it's tribute bands or, or spinoff kind of band. I know some of the guys that, that worked with Dio, like Last in Line, they've done things yeah. as well. And so many people have that affection for Rainbow. And it's always fun to see when other artists put their spin on something that they loved and that from somebody that made such an impact on them. For you, did metal come first or did the blues come first? Well, it's kind of a weird circle because when I first started playing bass, I actually started plunking out stuff on my mom's acoustic guitar, but I was always attracted to the sound of the bass. And she ha also had, uh, she, she wasn't a hippie, but she was hippie adjacent, if you know what I mean. So she had uh, Steppenwolf records and they, uh, they had Black Sabbath and, and uh, they had Deep Purple's Machine Head. Nice. So I started playing along with Deep Purple and Cream and stuff like that, and Led Zeppelin. And then when I was a teenager, actually, somebody gave me uh, Iron Maiden Killers. And uh, I was already into Ozzy and stuff like that. But, you know, it was just like, wow, this is what I want to do. And I started getting into Dio and uh, Judas Priest, Merciful Fate. He, I was a huge Merciful Fate King Diamond fan. And... Uh, I was always a Kiss fan growing up, you know, so my early days were definitely rock and metal. And uh, I was in a, a kind of a hard rock band called, well, my first band was a crossover band called Dead Conspiracy. And we played like four gigs at the Satyricon in Portland, which is like the CBGB mm -hmm. of Portland. And they say, if you've ever been in the bathroom at, at the Satyricon, then you're immune to COVID. Like so, Alcorazone? <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it was yeah. a total dive bar. It's gone now, but you know, that was those are my early days, but I really wanted to work as a musician. So I got into top 40 when I was 19 and 20. I just played whatever whatever I could get a gig doing and get paid to do. So and then down the road, I lived in Seattle for a while and I worked in the top 40 circuit up there. Top 40 rock and we were doing like, you know, whatever was popular on the radio or and we did hard rock too. We did like we'd play heaven and hell, you know, when the club owner left, you know, we'd play that. Uh, but when I moved down to Portland again, uh, it, I fell into the blues because the blues is really big in Portland. 
So if you want to work as a musician, get paid. I was like, I got to do this. But it was kind of like, oh, wait a minute. So those uh, John Paul Jones licks and stuff were like, oh, OK, I understand this. So it was like this kind of a circle, you know, but I've yeah. been a blues musician, you know, ever since. And mostly I re I've released a lot of albums, self-released as Lisa Mann and doing blues, contemporary blues. But I sneak Iron Maiden licks in there sometimes. And most people don't know what they are. <laughs> They're like, hey, that's really cool. And you're like, <laughs> yeah, yep, sure every is. now and then somebody will hear it. And I'll go, OK, I know what that is. Yeah. <laughs> and I have to say, because, you know, you're, you're talking about some of the artists that I love as well. And I, we were laughing before we started recording about the ghost tea. And if I had known, I'd have worn mine because know. you know that, and we're both excited for avatar coming up, you know, yeah. have you ever thought of crossing over into their style? Like more of the avant-garde kind of weird metal that they do. I don't know because, well, first I'll tell you how, how white crone came to be. Okay. Because I'm a member of the Recording Academy. And so I'm investigating, like, what are the bands in the categories I know? I vote in the categories I know. I vote in blues, roots. You know, I'll vote in, like, the, the traditional R&B. And I'll vote in the rock and metal categories. Or the metal category. There's only one freaking category, which is a song category. So I yeah. saw this band called Ghost. And I was like, I've heard of them, but I never heard of them. And I heard Cerise. And it was just like from those first guitar, that guitar intro, it's kind of sounds like a Slayer tune, you know yeah. what I'm saying? You hear that. And then, and then this Mr. Friendly guy starts singing, you know, like Michael Stipe on the vocals. It's like, what the hell is this? But it's songwriting. And there, I swear to God, that song just went inside and it just got in there. I started getting into their music and I thought, you know, you can do something that's, that's, hard rock metal you know and still be like songwriting you could still just craft songs and all of a sudden i started hearing melodies in my head i'd be washing my hair driving my car and i would just hear shit in my head and i got my phone and i got this app on my phone and i just started singing stuff into it and pretty soon i started writing whole songs and uh you know i try to hear it before i play it so really i just have to follow What's it? I know it's, I'm taking a long time to no, get to the no. freaking point. So I, I kind of follow what I hear in my head and what yeah. I hear in my head is very informed by what I grew up with. And what I grew up with was, you know, the proto metal of, of Sabbath. I grew up with Ozzy, grew up, you know, with King Diamond and Priest and Maiden, definitely a lot of Maiden influences. And uh, so I really just follow that. You know, what, what I'm going to, what I write is what I hear in my head. And boy, I would love to write something like Avatar does. I don't yeah. know if I could write something like Avatar does. Yeah. Like, that's, they're so freaking insanely good. That's that, one of the best bands I've ever seen live too. Yeah. That's the thing. They've got that mix of their sound is so great. And it has that throw of the Gothenburg sound, which I'm always like yeah. the Gothenburg sound is the special sauce. And then their yeah. shows the live aesthetic value they do. It's just like one of probably the all time best live bands I've ever seen hands ever. down. Like, you know what I mean? I love made and I catch them every time they come through and they've got the most insane stage shows, but when it comes to the real theatrics, you can't go wrong with avatar ever. But it's so everybody. So good. So everybody good. else on the bill. Just go hide. Well, you know, I don't know room. if you caught Avatar a few years back um, when they came through and they had Hell's a Poppin, that freak show. I did. I saw them in Denver. That was the we most insane. Yeah, that opener, like, oh my gosh, you know. <laughs> I did pretty. not expect that people I'm like for any of you who don't know how's a pop and you got to look them up. They're like sticking like hooks through their noses and hanging bowling balls and, you know, just swallowing knives and holding uh, lawnmowers with their chin. Was, the I, show, yeah. I did not expect that. Cause I was kind of like, okay, who's how's a pop and what's this band? And <laughs> oh my gosh, not a band, <laughs> but I was instantly addicted. It's kind of that really creepy yeah. thing. And it was the perfect start to their show. Like what totally. is this? Yeah. Totally. So, Loved it. Yeah, it was like the side circus for sure. It was really oh, yeah. cool. So when you got to White Crone and you just started doing metal, did did people that you followed you for your blues kind of feel like maybe you departed your ways from the blues or did they get what you were doing? Some of the so-called blues Nazis 
Yeah, definitely did. But you would be surprised how many people uh, like both. They like both. And there's a lot of people that occupy that middle ground, like the Gary Moore kind of ground. Yeah. There's a lot of guitar players out there. Uh, and that's why Alistair Green and I, so yeah, uh, my husband plays bass as well. And he's a bass player for a band, uh, for a band leader named Sugar Ray Rayford. And he's been nominated for a Grammy and nice. he's, you know, incredible front man. And uh, for a while, Alistair Green was in that band. And so I went out kind of on tour and I sang some backup and stuff with Sugar Ray. And I got to know Alistair and he's like, yeah, heavy metal. Totally. I love, you know, and he's like Richie Blackmore and he loved, you know, uh, he loves Maiden too. He loves all the old school stuff that I do. And so, uh, yeah, there's, there's just so many. And, uh, there's a guy named JP Soares that's working out of, uh, Florida. Who's a brilliant blues slide player and songwriter. And he actually was in a metal band for a while in Florida. And so there's a lot of people that occupy the same space. I remember one time I was at a blues festival and I had this gig bag and it said Slayer on it. And I bought it at a Slayer show, you know, <laughs> and and people would come up to me like I'm signing CDs in the booth. And these guys would come up to me and go, hey, I like Slayer, too. And they're kind of like, it's like a dirty secret. <laughs> That's awesome. It's, and it's great that they were like, hey, I like Slayer instead of give me three song names instead of, you know, like, oh, it, yeah, people that do that. But okay. that's so funny. So now it's like, you know, and Slayer has, has hung it up now. Hey, Slayer, maybe you should do some blues. Maybe there you go. Get the blues circuit. That would be that, so cool. I would that, love to see know, something Slayer in blues. Nurgle's doing blues. So why not? Yeah. Why it's not me and my man's thing. Yeah. That's really, it was that threw me. I didn't expect that from Nurgle, but you can't expect anything from Nurgle. He does outside of the bounds for everything. That's yeah. Right. Yeah. So, Coming for blues and being at blues is really prevalent in Portland. And I know they have the blues festival South of Portland in summertime. Is that happening this year? Are you going to be out doing any gigs? It's happening tomorrow. I'll be there. It's happening tonight. Curtis Salgado is there. My friend Ben Rice is playing guitar with him. And uh, tomorrow I'm going to be there with the Northwest women rhythm and blues Nice. And uh, that's pretty. That's pretty fun. Sunny Hess is a local guitar player, and band leader. She puts together these big showcases. It's really awesome. And then, uh, uh, then I get to play on um, the fourth on July fourth. Uh, ben Rice and I are backing up Johnny Rawls, who uh, he used to be Ov Wright's band leader. Ov Wright since passed on. Uh, you remember, you remember, I don't know if you ever that. I'd rather go blind, crippled and crazy. Yep, yeah. Somewhere pushing up daisy. So he was the band leader for that artist. Nice. And so it's he's a real soul man. And he sings some nasty songs too, man. It's really funny. And uh, so we're backing him up on the fourth. I'm just really excited. We just had a rehearsal today and I'm just like, I'm stoked because I love, I mean, I just love all kinds of music. I love soul music. I haven't done a soul gig in a long time. So doing soul blues, whatever, you know, heavy metal. I, I, I've got an Americana album out now, you know, it's got a little country flair. I just love music. So I'm doing it all. But yeah, Waterfront Blues is happening. It's smaller. They, they, they had to downsize mm -hmm. uh, and they're kind of social distance and pods and stuff. But yeah. uh it's happening. Yeah, because we have a blues festival up here called the Sky River Blues Festival. And I believe the last I heard, they are going to shutter that for this year just because of everything with COVID. And they just, for planning, was it, there was not enough time to really put it together. So it'll be nice to have it back again once it comes back. But yeah. the it's blues aren't like the big prevalent thing. And like in Seattle, you know, used to be a rock town. And yeah, then it got grunge. And now we've got so many techie people that moved here. The whole vibe has changed and of the style of music. So it's it's harder and harder to find and connect with things. Although we still have, you know, Blues Alley and the venues and stuff that cover blues. This is not as easy to find that. And I'm always looking there, for metal. Yeah, a lot of them closed down. Yeah. Larry's closed down. There's a lot of, you know, Highway 99 closed down. That was like my favorite place to play up there so yeah like one and one yeah. by one it's getting harder yeah 
it is hard to tour. And that's happening to uh, artists of all stripes because a lot of the small clubs that are in between those bigger uh, venues, especially in the West, you know, it's those grits and gas gigs that musicians need to fill in the blanks when you're on tour going from, you know, your, your uh, anchor dates. And uh, so it's going to be rough for touring artists, but boy, when they're touring, yeah, you're going to come out in droves and, and you're you know, selling out. They've had a ton of announcements, but it, unfortunately, like you said, the Pacific Northwest, we've been skipped because it's just, we are those pass-throughs to Vancouver, BC or to wherever they're going. And without that, we're not going to get a ton of shows. I had lots of tickets. I had tickets. And now they're not coming to Portland. Yeah. That's the other thing I'm seeing. I'm like pissed. People are saying that shows that they had tickets for are not coming back here. And I was just looking at, Oh, who was it that just announced? And I was so upset they're not coming up here. It was so sad. I'll remember after we're done, but they just, yeah. that was the, they skipped us up here and people are like, well, how do we get tickets, you know, our money back or what are we doing? We just want shows. And yeah. Yeah. So mega tours. I mean, I was really bummed because the whole COVID thing, you know, canceling so many tours and, you know, Kansas was supposed to come out. I believe it was Kansas or Boston and they had Europe was on tour with them and they oh, haven't played wow. like massive arenas in I want to say since the eighties and I thought, Oh, this is going to be the best show ever. And it didn't happen. So hope and thing that's still like that. Yeah. Yeah. So mm -hmm. what else are you working on this year? Are you writing new music outside of, you know, doing the Stargazer song? Are you working on a new album? Yes, actually. Um, and it slowed things down a lot, the COVID and all that stuff. And we have family issues and just all kinds of stuff has been happening, you know, since, since the pandemic came down i joined a band called splintered throne splintered throne and so yeah. they're an existing band from portland Pacific northwest and they had this really tall dude that sang man brian garrison and he i just loved him and uh great singer great band and i was a fan so you know i saw them they opened for i think they opened for last in line but i saw them open for somebody and then I was like, this was in Portland. And, and so I was like, damn, this band is killer. You know, so when I found out they were playing again, I go see them. And one night I was out with a friend of mine. And they announced that their singer was leaving. And, and then my friend goes, hey, go talk to them on the break. Go talk to them. So I talked to them, did an audition. And yeah, I joined the band. They hired me, joined the band. And uh, we've been writing songs and the songs are pretty killer. You know, I want to say They're that pretty killer. the last time. Yeah. I want to say the last time I thought I saw Splinter Throne and I, if, I might be wrong in this, but I could have sworn it was opening on Jonathan Davis's solo tour. If for some reason, it seems like that that I was the know. band that opened for them. Cause you talk about I the really no tall idea. member in the band too, like really, and that's he just stood, stuck yeah, out. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that I could, pretty sure their name was splintered throne but i know the name so yeah, yeah that's that sounds fun so are you guys uh where are you in the oh. writing process are you getting ready to start laying music we, down? the songs are written the songs are written we have a couple of gigs um i had a little setback with my voice i'm hoping these gigs go okay but it's getting better and uh uh we're gonna get in the studio real soon nice i'm telling you, these these songs uh, Jason Moser's, uh, he, he writes the majority of the material. He's kind of the band leader and, uh, he's great. He's just a brilliant, I, I mean, the thing is he gets it. And, and I don't know, maybe it's just because I'm a woman of a certain age. And I so am I remember, I remember the big four when they were like playing small clubs and I just jump on the stage and stage dive and whatever, you know? And so he, he and I are from that same era. And he just gets it. He gets that style of music. And so I, 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 I'm able to write vocals. I'm not playing bass in that band. So uh, there, there's another Brian. There's a Brian on the bass. So there's Brian Garrison. Was the, the, but Brian Bailey plays bass. Uh, and uh, yeah, I, I'm excited. I'm really excited about this. So. So, and is We're, that going to be a different feel for you not playing the bass? Are you playing any instruments at all while you're playing? Or are you no, just vocals? No, I have helped some in the songwriting process because 
uh, you know, that's what I do is I write songs and record them. I'm pretty much a recording artist. Uh, but uh, so I've been able to kind of craft, like change the chorus. It's like he writes a chorus for me. I'm like, no, put a dominant chord there or something. And uh, but no, I'm not going to be. I don't know. I've, I've done a little bit of lead singing, but it's going to be weird. Not look, like be strapped up with this. Yeah, yeah. that's going to be weird. Yeah. So, yeah. That feels, you know, and I thought that's funny you said it because I'm also a photographer and I shoot a lot of live shows and, and the first event I went back to live and I didn't even think to dig credentials. I went to see Jeff Tate when he came up here uh, in, in May, he played the Everett historic and it was sold out. And I stood there and I was like, I'm just going to enjoy a show. And I forgot how hard it is for me just to stand there and watch a show because I'm usually doing something and working. And I'm like, well, this just felt weird. So it, I can imagine for you when you play an instrument yeah. as well and your vocals, that it's just going to be a little weird to step into a different direction. Yeah. And you also can't cue the band. You can't, you can't boss the band around because as the band leader, you know, as Lisa Mann and the band <laughs> for that, um, <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm always playing on the one. I'm playing the first beat. And so I can, you know, okay, we're going to the four, everybody. You know, when I don't have anything, I'm like, what do I do? I just shake my fist at him. <laughs> it's like, have you seen that viral video that's been going around on Facebook about the, the singer that tells the drummer that he's off time or something? And then the drummer comes out from behind the kit and they just start. I did just, see that. Like, I wonder if that was the situation. Maybe the guy himself played an instrument and he was thinking, okay, you're off time. But it just, yeah. Again, and, you know, and since you know your timing, you're going to be like, come, come on. on <laughs> be on the stick. That is awesome. <laughs> that is awesome. So along your career, you have been nominated and won your own awards. What does it mean to you to have that kind of recognition? And I know like if you see like the Hall of Fame and people every year, they complain about certain types of artists not getting into certain things. Does that bother you? How do awards affect you? And what do you think of the people that kind of just don't understand the process? Yeah. Well, you know, like, uh, I've won two blues music awards and uh, that is a voting process and you have to be a member of the blues foundation. And so, you know, people who are members of the blues foundation tend to be people who want to support artists. They want to support the genre. Uh, they support their local blues societies, for instance. And so, you know, it really is cool to get that recognition from, from blues lovers and from our peers uh, the nomination process is from the, the board. Uh, there's been some controversies here and there about, you know, is it getting too rock and roll, um, you know, and some racial inequities and people are really focused on changing that for the better and making that better uh, because blues is black music. And so we have to respect the black community, number one. Well, and um, in essence, rock and roll is as well because it started with blues. I mean, that People have got to understand the history. Baby. Yeah. The blues had a baby and they named it rock and roll. But, you know, the, the thing is, is whatever award it is, whether it's voting from peers, whether it's voting from the public, uh, the Blues Blast Award is like that. It's a vote from the public. Um, you just have to subscribe to the magazine. Uh, they have, if you're, if you're going to do that, it has to happen somehow. Yeah. And it's never going to be perfect. Never going to be perfect. Uh, there's always going to be, you know, uh, the Jethro Tull issue. There's always going to be something like that that happens. But, I, you know, I, I've just, I'm always, I was dumbfounded when I won, especially the first Blues Music Award because uh, for bass playing. Because I, I was like, who, who am I? And Bob Stroger, who's like this legendary bass player, was also nominated. And I won. And I was like walking up to the stage going, what the hell? And so there really is a wonderful feeling, you know, just to get the recognition of your peers. And so I'm not going to. I'm not going to shit on it. No way. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. And that's, you know, I think a lot of people forget that because I've been out to the Grammys before and, you know, there's a whole different thing that goes on. Like, and people think like if they just watch an award show that yeah. there's so much going on behind the detail that's not seen. And I, I mean, I, I do, I do complain about the Grammys and the lack of oh, yeah. metal and rock support or the, the artists that they put in those genres yeah. that are clearly not, but yeah, here's the issue. There's only one category. A few years ago, 
In blues, there was only one category. So the Blues Foundation made a push. And there were people who were even like, I will help you out financially if you can't afford to join because you're a full-time working artist. And there's a lot of full-time working people in metal too. But the thing is they had a push to get artists to join and to get blues labels to join. And guess what? Now there's two blues categories. So right now there's only one metal category and it's only for song. It's not for an album category or, or, or for band or whatever. They need to expand that damn category, but it's not, there's not enough metal artists who are joining the recording Academy because the recording, that Grammy show is this tiny glitzy little, you know, corny tip of the iceberg. When below there's all these educational opportunities, there's, uh, uh, marketing opportunities you can connect with with producers engineers all kinds of people they have get-togethers they had zoom meetings a few times this year there'd be christmas parties where you really meet people who are in the industry like-minded people so i really want to encourage if there's any metal artists that are watching this don't be afraid check it out check out the recording academy and you know see if there's somebody who can who can sponsor you to join because it's worth it. If you're full time, it's worth it. You know, and that's great insight because I don't think a lot of people realize what goes behind and what the other things are and avenues they need to be involved in to make that's that right. change. So, and I know like for you being female artists, I've got to ask this because I, I do some work with the She Rocks Awards. I get on, I shoot their show and I love the organization. I think it's ph phenomenal what they do yeah. for artists. And there's so many men that are coming along and joining as part of partners and doing things with them because of the support that they do. And they realize themselves that some women artists are not getting the support that they need or the, ac the accolades that they should get. What do you think of organizations like the She Rocks that go out of their way to help women and foster that, that camaraderie, but also help them with the business side of things and yeah. to build that, I guess, the community where there hasn't been one? Yeah. Well, you know, I, I would love it if we didn't have to have anything like that. I would love that. I would love if DJs just mixed us into their playlists, if festival bookers just mixed us in instead of having let's have the female showcase over here you know for an for one day or something yeah i wish we didn't have it but i i i think they're wonderful uh like i said i work with uh northwest women rhythm and blues here in portland and sunny Hess. she took a lot of green singers under her belt that are now working you nice. know full time as musicians uh michelle seidman who also has a national women in blues and she takes uh, a lot of young women under her wing, but also they network with each other and they come from all around the world. And so whatever organizations that are doing this, you know, it needs to be done. It has to happen uh, until we get to that day when we're just on rotation like anybody else, you know. Yeah. And it's sad that as an artist that you have to say that to you, because myself as a listener, I yeah. know that I. I mean, there's a, there's a few things with radio myself that really drive me crazy. Like the fact that they still play tracks that are like 20 and 30 years old and, and it's constant rotation. It's not like, Hey, let's just put them in as part here and there. It's a constant. You're going to hear them every two or three hours in their rotation instead of feeding in new artists and feeding in more female artists as well. I mean, I don't think that, you know, I don't, I'm not saying that, Oh, I'm a woman. I should have more access to things. I'm just saying it would be nice to feel like I can relate with the music I'm hearing more often because I know there are a ton of female artists out there that do great metal and rock and blues. And I would like to hear that stuff as a listener. And so I feel like as part of the demographic, I don't count. And yeah. I would, I would like to see that even out somewhat because it's not just based on, Hey, you know, you're a chick and we should play you more. It's based on, it's really great music. And I think that everybody should have that same chance as same with up and coming artists. They just don't have a voice. And yeah. I think that people need to do better at fostering that for female artists as well as new artists. That's why I want to thank you for doing this interview today. I really want to thank you. You know, it took some time to get to it. And I, I was saying last night to an interview I was doing that I get so caught up because I get so busy and it's yeah. not that I don't want to interview new artists or any new artists or just artists period. I just, sometimes I'm so busy that I have to find time on my schedule to get it all done. And yeah. Whew, sometimes I have it. Well, not sometimes. I always have a problem with overcommitting <laughs> because I want to help everyone. And that's just. I get it. I had a sign on my computer for a while that said, say no. Oh. 
<laughs> I've had better to- off saying no to some people than saying, I'm sorry, I can't get out of bed. I'm too exhausted. Yeah. And I've had that. I've had to learn the say no, because when I first started this, it was been about a decade since I got into doing this. And, you know, I did it because people kept telling me there was no music in Seattle. And I was like, wait a second, what are you talking about? There's music here. I, I mean, it shows all the time, except for last year, <clears throat> which we really had a lot more shows now, but, uh, you know, and so it's, I, I just realized there was such a need and I didn't realize how bad the need was. And it's everywhere I go that there's that need. And so I work with artists from around the world and and yeah. it's just shocking to me how many people have the need and they just don't have access or they don't understand what they need to understand about the industry. And mm-hmm. so, you know, part of what I do educational, part of it is, you know, business work. And the other is to try to help listeners and musicians connect with each other because it's got to get done. Thank you. Well, I fucking mm-hmm. appreciate it. Oh, you're very <laughs> welcome. And I'm so glad you decided to come on and super yeah. excited to hear your new single stargazer that's coming out. I'm like, I love new music and I love to hear new things. And I'm not, I love my old school stuff because I am, I'm, I think we're the same age and I grew up in that same time frame where the music we were getting imprinted with has stuck with us forever, but I yeah. still love to hear the new stuff that's coming out. Even though there's a lot of music has already been done yeah. and you hear a lot of that influence over and over, there's still good gyms out there that you can find. Yeah. Oh, hell yeah. And you know, I, I like to call myself the unfrozen cave woman of metal because <laughs> You know, like in the 90s, I started getting into, you know, play bass, started getting into Red Hot Chili Peppers and and Level 42. And, you know, I started going off into soul and then I got into blues. I was like, oh, little Milton, man, I can't get enough Jimmy Reed. You know, so I went off into that and then I kind of came back. But I always in my car, I'm like, listen, you know, with the blues band in the back, we're we're they're all like they love metal, too. So we're like jamming on metal and priest we're all singing along to sad wings and shit but you know but then i started discovering like you know bands that i'd never heard before like avatar and uh i'm like yeah this is great but i feel like all my references are really old because it's like all that whole all those people that came up with with pantera and stuff it's like I was just not even there, man. I just wasn't there. And you know, I'm, it's funny because I don't think I have met very many people who said the same. They just weren't quite at Pantera. And I'm, I appreciate what they contributed, but I just not, um, yeah. I'm not a super listener of Pantera music. And it's not yeah. that they weren't amazing musicians. It's just kind of like the grunge phase. There were a couple of bands like Soundgarden resonated with me yeah. and Alice in Chains, of course, because I grew up with the, the gang out here, you know, in Seattle. And yeah, but you know, the Nirvana, did, I did not connect with Nirvana at all. I, just, I connected with Nirvana later. Did you late in the later? Yeah. Later on, just as a songwriter to go, oh, wow. Okay. Well, he chose this instead of that. Now that's really interesting. Well, and that's know? probably as a songwriter side, I could totally see that. But for a listener, yeah. for me, I just kind of didn't really connect to it. And now I'm yeah. seeing, I've got my gear behind me. I'm learning. Yeah. I've been, I've been in the lockdown, the learning bass and guitar. And it's mainly because I I've got had songs in my head for years that I want to get out of my head. And when I talk to my other musician friends, they've never really seemed to get what I'm trying to get out of my head. So I had to learn and start learning to play so that I can at least yeah. really poorly get the chords out of my head that I want you know to put out there. That's what I did with the poisoner. Uh, when I, when I came up with this and here it is, here it is. You can get it on band camp, go to but white band camp, white Chrome, check it out. But and that's I your this guitar. And that's, that's your metal baby. album. That's the metal yeah. album right here. It's too shiny. There it is. Oh, I just love this artwork. I, I found this white witch online. Nice. And I hunted, I hunted down the artist. Now. Nice. But I bought this guitar. I bought this seven six string Schechter, Schechter. Because I play six string bass. And like I said, oh. you know, I there you go. Schechter. Schechter. Sweet, right? On. We have so much in common. This is awesome. Yeah, Schechter is the only bass <laughs> I want. Killer. It took me six months to find that sucker. So I was oh, right happy on. to get, yeah. That's, awesome. That's so awesome. But you just teach yourself, you know, yeah. and I can go on YouTube. There's all these tutorials. And so the thing is, I'm writing these songs. I've got these ideas and I'm thinking, well, I'm going to have a guitar player play this stuff, but I have to have him play exactly this, exactly that, him or her, have them play exactly this or that. And I'm like, well, as long as it's going to take, take me to teach them that, why don't I just teach myself how to do that? So I just started playing along. Okay, Glenn Tipton. I got a picture of Glenn Tipton on a tack over here. 
<laughs> and it says WWGTD question mark. What would Glenn Tipton do? So I learned a bunch of Glenn Tipton solos. I learned some Iron Maiden tunes. I learned a bunch of like Merciful Fate, King Diamond songs and, I was, and Black Sabbath songs. And then I'm like, okay, I'm good to go. I can do this. And it's still, um, the one guy on YouTube is like, oh, you get yourself a real guitar player. You're going to have a really great album. Your next album. <laughs> you know, it's so funny because I'm, <laughs> I'm such great friends with so many amazing guitar players. And I'm always mm -hmm. embarrassed to tell them I'm learning to play guitar. And they're, but when I do, they're like, they're so supportive. And even when I did my interview with KK Downing, he said, oh, I see you're learning to play guitar. Did you do that during lockdown? And so I was like, oh my God, I'm like completely embarrassed. Yeah, because it's like, yeah. And then, you know, then I'm talking to my friend Oige Valverta yesterday and yeah. he's, you know, the Finnish God on guitar. And, and we just sat after like talking after our interview, talking about guitar technique and everything. And I almost felt like Jesus, I should pay you. Oh yeah. I should have to pay you for that. Like yeah. if you're watching this way, I probably should pay you for that session, but it's, it's so interesting when you talk to musicians about how supportive it is when people are wanting to do it, but then also hearing other musicians when you're learning a different instrument so that you can write because John five, at one point I asked him, you know, when you started playing, you know, and you started learning, what was it that the technique that you would say to anybody who's learning? He says, find somebody who's going to teach you what you want to learn. And yeah. I thought, wow, that's such a monumental thing because I don't want, there's a lot of things I don't want to learn to play like styles, but yeah. there, but if you can get somebody to, right off the bat to help you learn something that you, it's going to yeah. stick with you right away. And I think that like hearing you talking about what you started playing on your guitar, it's, it keeps you from getting that frustration because you're learning stuff that you really already, you already have the ear for. Yeah. And so you can learn it a little bit easier. Yep. And I've got blues friends that were like, well, I can show you how to play, you know, you know what? I know a million killer blues yeah. guitar players just in this town. I don't need to learn how to play blues guitar. I can call them up. Hey, come over track. And okay. you have one of the, <laughs> one of the most killer guitar players down there in Jennifer Batten. So and Jennifer Batten, actually, you know, she, she and I have become friends and, it's yeah. really, you know, it's really I, cool. I did uh, an interview with her and Janina Jade. They did a, she did some work on her album. And then um, I did, took her cloud, uh, cloud symposium, guitar cloud symposium. Yeah. And anybody yeah. watching this, that guitar cloud symposium is so cool. You get access to amazing guitar players. And then you get a group of people that you can talk to if you're learning to play. And it's so supportive, yeah. but yeah. it, and, you know, I didn't, you know, I didn't realize that Portland was so stacked with such amazing, you know, not only guitar players, but then you've got blues players and yeah. bassists. Paul and, Gilbert. Yeah. Paul Gilbert's down here. Yeah. Yeah. It, my friend Timber played bass and went on tour with him. Yeah. It's so crazy how small mm -hmm. when you get to the, into the music world, it is when you find people in that community. But yeah, it's, you know, and, and so, so you were talking about your album and learning to play guitar and getting all this out of your head. Any chance that you might do an, like another White Crone album or? Yeah. yeah, I have five songs that are in skeletal form. Okay. So, you know, I, I usually come up with like a, a melody, uh, a, a chord progression, a riff. I'll hear it in my head and then I'll execute it and try to record it. And then I build on that. And then it's like, I call it like elbows, uh, ankles and elbows. Cause it's like, you get the big bones of the song together first and then you fill in the blanks and then I start crafting lyrics and stuff. So they're really pretty much in like, I've got bass lines, but you know what? I think I may work with a real guitar player because some of the stuff that I I'm hearing in my head is like way beyond me. Like I wrote all the drums and I got on the poisoner. I wrote the drums. I can do that. I can't play it well. I can play the drums well enough to show you what I want. But some of the stuff I'm kind of hearing in my head is like, yeah, I think I'm going to need some help. Yeah. I, I've got friends that have offered to help me with writing my songs and wanting to collaborate with me. And I'm like, the stuff that's in my head is really scary. It's the, it's, you know, that the trauma and the rage things you're working through in your life. And, yeah. and I'm scared to let it out, but like, I've, I've gotten like lyrics out for the first few things that I'm getting down yeah. the style that I want. And it's actually scared me what came out. And I was like, Oh my goodness. <laughs> it's gonna it be really really dark when it comes out <laughs> good <laughs> i might have to go to gothenburg for this one <laughs> there you go there's so, plenty of musical help there if you had advice for somebody getting new into music 
that you could look back at your own career and everything over the years that you wish somebody would have told you or taught you right off the bat, what advice, you know, would you give someone that you wish you would have known early on? Wow. I mean, there's just so much, uh, I would really suggest if you can get to know the business side of things and, you know, try to be a generalist. There are some people who just aren't good at that. And if you aren't, if you're one of those people that is really good at writing and playing and all that stuff, real, you know, wood shedder, then find somebody who can help you with that stuff. Because once you start recording and releasing music, um, if you use an app, you know, I use a CD baby. That's what I use, you know, to get to all the Amazons and iTunes. There will be money on the table and somebody else is making that money. And so you, I, it took me a while to learn this. I learned that late in life. There is money out there that belongs to you and it's in escrow somewhere and somebody else has it, even if it's just a little bit of that Spotify money, whatever, make sure you learn how to do that and copyright your material and stuff like that. So yeah. that's, that's my advice. Learn something about the business side of things. And that is a huge thing. I think a lot of people still today don't understand anything about the business. And I work with up and coming artists and it's just, getting them used to the fact of things that you should definitely know, like seriously, like if you, if you think you want to write with your band, you better get a contract to start with. Even if it's just between friends, how mm -hmm. many times have we seen artists down the road where there have been some sort of mega dispute over the royalties, the writing, just yeah. how things work, put it in writing, everybody sign it, you know, have a lawyer, look mm -hmm. it over, make sure it's legit. And then you don't have to worry about it. Then get back to the business of just making your music. But then when yeah. it comes down the line, you don't necessarily need a label right off the bat. You know, that's just somebody else intermediary is going to take your money. You can do a lot of yeah. stuff DIY now, unless you're really ready for like a top tier label. Yeah. Really think about that. There's a lot of things that I see that I think that sometimes if just bands would just consult with an, an artist manager, just to kind of see if they do any consulting, Hey, like, can I pay you a hundred dollars for a consulting fee? And you help kind of guide me. Yeah. Those kinds of things. And people do that. There are a ton of PR reps out there, myself included, that will sit down with you. And if you want to do a consultation fee, just to kind of talk about what you need to be doing for your own PR, those kinds of things are invaluable if you're doing a release or anything. And I think there's so many people who forget that there are people out there who want to help you. Yeah. So to find people there. Are, there are a ton of us out there that would connect with you and help you do stuff. Yeah. So, but you're not alone in the business side. And I, I can't believe how many people today still forget that if you want to be a working artist, there is a business side of it. Even if it's down to just working the venues and getting your payout from the night that it's amazing how many people will try to not pay you when you've played a venue. So uh -huh. Uh -huh. Or like, you have to come back in the morning. No, no, don't leave without your money. Oh, that, that's that happened kind of, to me. Yeah. That's happened to me. And we're like, well, we'll just stay here. Oh, well, the yeah. club owner went home. She went to sleep. I'm like, <laughs> oh, that's okay. Oh, wake her up. We'll wait right here for her. Are you familiar with the band Green Jelly? Yeah. So that's green, the little bit, little bit. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. they had a, an issue like a year and a half ago where the they played a big venue for a show and they went to get paid and the guy had already left and had taken their money. And Bill goes up to the guy's house with video camera on everything. He's like, oh You're gonna God. pay me. You are gonna pay me. And it was a couple of days ordeal, but they got their money. He was like, no, oh. we're not doing this, but oh, it's man. amazing that even today people still have to fight to get their money back. It's oh, like, yeah. you've earned Howard that money. Tansman. Yeah. Yeah. Howard, it's Howard, Howard, Howard Tansman. Oh, you still owe me Ouch. $300. So anyway. Ouch. That's the, but that's the people, people need to know that you can't rip people Watch off. Like, Howard <laughs> yeah, that's, and you know, there are bookers have gone down over the last couple of years because of things like that. And yeah, it's, it's definitely a shark infested waters you're swimming yeah. in as a musician. So great yeah. advice to, to, to anybody that's getting started that make sure that they navigate their way and understand about registering their music and their cop, their publishing and their copyright and you learning how to get that money that people owe you because yeah. They're not going to always willingly hand, hand over that money. You're going to have to hunt it down. Yeah. Wow. It was yeah. meager sense. 
They so, add up. They do add up. <laughs> they they do. And that's the, it's so sad that it comes down to that part of it. Like, and so let me ask why we're talking about earning money. Mm-hmm. How can fans that love blues and love metal connect with your music, buy your music? Do you have merch? What can they get their hands on? Yes. Well, like I said, White Crone, the Poisoner, right here, full length, traditional heavy metal. If you like Maiden and Priest, and you, there's even some Man Awards, Accept influences in here. Uh, so this is on Bandcamp. So it's whitecrone.bandcamp.com. And I have patches. And sadly, I am not going to release. I have a cover of Venom, Seven Gates of Hell. That's on this album and it's available digitally and it's available on Bandcamp, but that's grandfathered in. They've changed the rules. That's another thing people need to get up on the millennium, the music millennium, you know, this new update that -hmm. happened. Uh, You have to get a special license if you want to put something on Bandcamp because they're not opted in like Spotify, Amazon, they're all big profit makers. They opted into this new system. And yeah, you can't do it on Bandcamp unless you get a special license. So that single Stargazer will sadly not be available on Bandcamp. It will be on Spotify, YouTube Music, Amazon Music. uh, And I'm going to be selling it on my personal White Crone website, whitecrone.com, and you can download uh the track there it's nine minutes it's longer than the original it's really you know why it's longer it's because Vinny Atmosy sent me this track and he started like doing this kick-ass stuff at the end and I was like I'm not gonna cut that out no way so I was like I'm gonna go to the end <laughs> yeah so yeah whitecrone.com that's where you can find out more and where you can uh, uh on July 9th after July 9th you can download uh, that track. Nice. One last question for you. Anything else you want to say to your fans and people that are just coming to your music? Well, I'm just, you know, I've been doing blues for a while. And so, you know, I was like, Oh, I'll make a metal album and then I'll get a publicist or a PR agent. And then they'll just promote it for me. And then everybody I talked to was just like, who are you? You know, who are you? And so I got this small PR agent in Australia, uh, Noob Heavy, he promoted the CD and he got to some, a lot of these great underground sites and there's a lot of great underground metal and a lot of people listened to it um, and really loved, they loved it. And they told me they loved it and they told me they still listen to it and it ended up on a bunch of uh, like top five, underground metal lists of 2020 nice. and and the bottom line is you know when people listen when you listen even if you don't even have to pay anything just just go to the band camp and get your free stream and just stream it all the way to the end just sit for nine minutes or six minutes or whatever the track is when you do that it makes us feel really good because this is, this is our heart and soul that we put into this when we make music, when we're in the studio. And you know that when a tree falls in the forest and nobody's there to hear, does it make a sound? Yes. Yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> it sucks. It's a terrible feeling. So when you, when you hear it, you like it, let them know. Put a comment. You know, put a comment on their YouTube channel. Put a, you know, their band camp. Review their band camp, you know. It really does make a difference. Every little listen, it makes us feel, you know, like what we do is worthwhile. So just let those bands know. Even You don't have to spend a lot of money. Just just let them know that, that, that you like what you hear. And that's awesome. You know, and I love that you touch on that because I don't think people, the normal regular listeners who aren't musicians realize how much artists agonize over the analytics. Like it, you're going to be looking at your YouTube analytics. You're looking at your Spotify artist analytics. You're looking at every spot you've got your band camp. You're wanting to see. Yeah. And so if people are listening or if, if there's something going on that you're just trying to figure out why your music didn't connect with people, if yeah. people just kind of kind of tune in and kind of let you know, like, Hey, I love this. Or, you yeah. know, I didn't connect with it just because something was weird to me. 
not like hey just troll you and hey your music just sucks you know but like yeah, constructively say more of those people yeah yeah, yeah but you like it, yeah. people can actually let artists know like if there's something they love and engage with them and it it just builds this really cool thing where it can help morph music the next time sometimes it doesn't but sometimes it does that you might find something on a next release that you really really love that's a great point that's a great point I started getting a lot of airplay for a song, a blues song. I don't even sing anymore in my set. Ooh. I had no idea. I had no idea. See, and, and I'm always pushing music. So sometimes something, and it's so weird, but here's the other thing I know that like a lot of times people think that their album has really been out in front of people. And it, it, maybe you have like the best PR in the world, but still you're only getting like that, that tiny niche of people. There's millions of people that may have never still have heard of your album. And so you, sometimes you just have to kind of come up and pop up old songs or, you know, make something fresh again. And it's yeah. always surprising to me when I come across an album that's been out for four or five years and I'd never heard of the artist before. And I'm like, how did you not get on my radar? And it's weird how I find things. And it's not Spotify's yeah. recommendations that are finding albums that I like because no. it doesn't work on me. So yeah, it's, yeah. People need to engage with what people are doing. And then, you know, I think too, if you, if you like somebody's band camp, it also suggests you other band camps that are going to be kind of similar. So yeah. that helps you find stuff that you really want to find better than the Spotify's do. Yeah. Yeah. Don't yeah. be afraid also to c c connect with us on social media. Cause a lot of us are just bullshitting on Twitter. Yeah. And I think yeah. a lot of people don't realize a lot of the people are running your own social media. So you have yeah. right there is straight access to an artist that, if you want to talk to them and say that you really loved something, that artist nine times out of 10 is the one looking at what you write. So, yeah. 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 Well, it's been so awesome talking with you, Lisa, you guys go find her on Bandcamp, find her on whitecrone.com connect, buy some music. You know, I heard patches in there and I'm working on a new battle vest for next year's Bakken. So I will come get one of your patches. <laughs> so I want that on my vest. So awesome. this will be really fun. It's time to get some new patches out there. Yeah. And, you know, guys really connect meet new artists. You've not met before discover other genres, love music and love what these artists are doing because without music, our world would really suck. Amen. Yeah. Thanks Lisa. And guys, I will see you on the next yeah. interview, but check out her music in between. <laughs>